Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kamal Kant. I'm Vice President Business Development at Ascent Overseas Education. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we're hosting an event for students in South India, and we supported by our good friends from University of Central Lancashire. Uh, and I'll shortly introduce you to them uh, while uh, some of you are still logging in. I thought we'll quickly give you an introduction. Some of you may have heard about Ascent, and some of you probably are already existing students of Ascent. And uh, I'll give you a quick uh, briefing on what Ascent does for students like yourselves. Firstly, thank you very much for joining this afternoon. I know we're all uh, in a very interesting phase at the moment, uh, digitally and dealing everything online. So let's see what we can do for you. Ascent is one of India's leading education consulting companies and works for assisting students and we can give you end-to-end -end, uh, services start to finish, starting from selection of your course, applications, uh, test preparation for IELTS, uh, if uh, any of the universities need you to take it. Uh, we do coaching online and offline. Uh, any loans and scholarships that students would be interested in knowing about. And of course, the most important thing is to get that colorful sticker on your passport. The visa counseling is more important because without a visa, you're not leaving India anytime anyway. So we also brief you with the visa process and help you with your visa applications. And we have a very high success rate of about 99% for more or less all the destinations that we uh, deal with. In addition to this, we also offer some support services with Forex ticketing and student housing that you might want to have. And uh, just before you leave the country, we also do a very detailed pre-departure briefing for all of you. And uh, that helps you to kind of starting from knowing what to pack and what not to pack on what are the things to uh, do when you arrive. And especially in the current challenging times like these COVID things, a lot of things would have changed in your travel and uh, arrival, dis arrival dates and destinations and stuff like that. So we brief you on all these aspects. And all these services are provided totally free of charge to the students. So what we're going to do today is to allow a team from uh, University of Central Lancashire View Plan to take you through uh, the uh, university uh, computing and engineering aspects. And uh, we also have uh, a gentleman, Adam, who's going to uh, present on uh, the intricacies of why your passwords are relevant or not relevant. Uh, he comes with a strong industry background. So this will also be a knowledgeable a uh, few minutes for you to spend today, and then we'll take things from there. So let me introduce you to the team. Uh, we have Nikki Danino, uh, she's the principal lecturer and academic lead for business development. Uh, Sam Connolly, uh, he's professional tutor in computing, who's gonna to present to you after Nikki's presentation on the importance of passport. And Adam Smiths, the faculty placement officer, which I'm sure most of you are excited about listening and uh, he'll take you through the jobs and placement scenario and other developments. And Mr. Govind Singh uh, Bish is uh, the director for South Asia. So he's also kindly agreed to join us uh, to guide the students today. So at the end of the session, uh, you can all notice there's a Q and A tab on your screen. If you can keep typing your questions there, we'll try and answer more or less all possible questions that we can today. Uh, while you uh, put your questions on the tab, uh, that would be easy for us to be more organized and take things from there. Okay. Um, can someone just let me know they can see my screen yes, okay? we can now. So, yeah. Brilliant. All right. Let's get cracking then. So. Today's presentation is a bit of an introduction into the world of security. Um, so I spent the past three years working in security companies with a lot of money behind them. And you would be very surprised at some of the basics that people get wrong and how much importance is placed on things that don't really matter that much. So passwords are a really interesting one. Passwords we see everywhere all over the internet. Every time you register for somewhere, they want a password and they've usually got all sorts of criteria behind the password. So they want a certain number of characters. Uh, they don't want it to make sense. They want alphanumeric characters. So a mix of letters, numbers. Um, they want mixed case, the so lowercase, uppercase, and typically symbols. Now, actually, none of this even matters that much. We're going to go over some of the attacks in today's presentation over what kind of attacks actually require passwords and how much a strong password really prevents that attack from occurring anyway. Um, 
what I will point out now is keep an eye on that do not reuse password because that is the best tip I think you will get from this whole presentation. So obviously we suggest using strong passwords for a good reason. This is usually down to these two topics here. So we've got brute force attacks and we've got dictionary attacks. Now a brute force attack is where someone tries to guess a password until they get it right. And a dictionary attack is where they use a list of predefined common passwords and they enter it in the hopes that one of them is right. Now, strong passwords do protect against this because it's difficult to guess. Now, the reason we place such a strong importance on strong passwords is because these two attacks are very, very easy to conduct. I I'm sure there are many uh, teenage children sat in their bedrooms at home who conduct these types of attacks because there's no real skill barrier on them. It's either guess a password or enter password from a list. Not only that, there's ample opportunity. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. That means that you're not confronted by your victim, so you're more likely to commit this. So, with that being said, let's look at some of the things that strong passwords do not protect against. And phishing is a great example of this one. This is probably going to be one of the most common attacks in um, most of cybersecurity. Phishing is the term used for when we try and fool someone into entering their own details. So this is usually through a mock website. Uh, we might make Facebook, we might make Twitter. Um, we just make it look the same and we email out something to the user and say, hey, your, your account, account is about to be closed. We need you to go and enter your details to stop this from happening. Now, we try to make the user panic. So a great way of doing this is unfortunately with banks because no one wants to lose all their money. We say your bank account's going to be closed. Go log in. The user hands over their details thinking it's the real site, but really not a chance that that is the real site. So how do secure passwords in this help? They don't. You hand over your password willingly to whoever has made the website. It's a sad fact that if you hand it over willingly, that there is nothing you can do to get that password back. There's nothing that can be done to protect it. And a strong password doesn't help. If you haven't reused a password though, of course they'll only have that one password. So how likely is this, to uh, is this attack to occur? It's very, very likely. So I was reading a Microsoft article which said um, about 0.5% of all emails a day are phishing attempts. And if you think how many emails are sent every day, 0.5% is a large amount. I would point out that obviously not many people fall for them, but it doesn't take many people to fall for it, for it to be effective. There is a very low skill barrier on this, which means more people are likely to do it. Um, if you think about how complex a login page actually is, it's not very complex at all, and it's very easily faked. It's typically just enter your details, such as an email address and a password. Uh, one thing I have noticed in recent years is workplaces are now educating their staff on phishing because it is such a common attack that we um, we do now educate people to in the hopes that we aren't handing out company data willingly. So that was phishing. Now we're going to get a little bit more complex. This one's called man in the middle. Man in the middle is a very advanced attack. And truthfully, you're probably unlikely to ever encounter it. So what is it? It takes a little bit of knowledge to understand how data flows through a network, such as the internet. So I want you to imagine every time you go to Facebook, what you're actually doing is posting a letter which goes all the way through the mail system to somewhere at Facebook. That's how data flows through a network. So usually you would expect it goes straight to the server of Facebook, which is just a big computer. Now in a man in the middle attack, that's not quite what happens. 
Instead, I want you to imagine while your envelope is halfway through transit to Facebook, someone at the post office opens up that envelope and all of a sudden has read what, everything you put inside that letter. That's what a man in the middle attack is. Now, the red line demonstrates the man in the middle attack on this, um, on this image fairly well, and the blue line is what you would usually expect to happen. The real difficulty with this attack is, as a user, you probably won't ever know it's taken place, because how would you know if your if your envelope's been opened when it's halfway through transit to Facebook? It's it's very difficult to detect. So how does a secure password in this help? They don't. If I open your envelope and it's got a password in there, guess what? I know your password. Um, there are type ways of encrypting passwords. However, using more complex man-in-the-middle attacks, it is also possible to decrypt those. Um, usually, your browser will warn you if it thinks you're a victim of this, which is great for modern security, but it's worth always paying attention when your browser says, we don't think the site is safe because this could be what it's trying to warn you of. How likely is this attack? It's very difficult to attack, which makes it very difficult to give an exact number on how many people are victims to this. It's quite easy to conduct on unsecured wireless networks, so things in coffee shops. Um, but having said that, the skill barrier for this attack is very high, which makes it less likely to occur than something like phishing. Key logging. So this goes by a few different names. This is what I knew it as, and I'm guessing it's what most people know it as. It's where you just record what keys a, a user enters on the computer. So it's a piece of malware, and it might track every key press on a keyboard. It might track every input on a keyboard on a phone, if it's a touchscreen one. Um, it tends to generate a big log file and stick all the key presses in there. So how do secure passwords in this? Again, they don't, you, you enter your passwords willingly, not knowing anything's wrong, and the hacker has your password. So again, this is just another example of an attack that isn't really aided by a secure password, uh, because all, all they're gonna look for is where you hit enter, and every time you hit enter, it's presumable that you've entered a password or submitted something so how likely is it? Not very likely, truth be told. Um, it's, it's very difficult to deploy things like this because it's a piece of malware and victims tend to realize when they have malware because if you're using Windows, for example, it does regular scans and it'll pick it up. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, less technical people may fall victim to this. Um, you may also notice a slight slowdown of your machine if the key logger isn't very well written. And the, the key thing about this is it records all data that you enter in your keyboard. And everyone who types quite a lot uses a, a lot of key presses. So it makes it less likely for a hacker to actually find what they're looking for in the logs. And not only that, they've got to find a way to retrieve the logs after. So that can be done through something called phone in home, where it sends over the internet the, the log file. But if the person doesn't have an internet connection, then they're going to have to go onto the computer to find it. Now, that's very difficult to do without someone realizing, unless you live within a close proximity to them. Local discovery. This is the fanciest name for an attack that I think I've ever come across. It means to look around a desk, around a diary, or in a bin for passwords that people have written on notes and you would be surprised at how many people do this not thinking about it because I've certainly walked out of an office of a night and I've noticed on my desk when I've been looking up that someone's left a password lying on the desk and if I've noticed it other people have noticed it it's a wonder how many people have seen that password so how does a secure password in this help it doesn't I'm not sure I need to explain why but 
if you write down your password, anyone has your password. Um, realistically, if you give them the opportunity for a hacker to use your password, then they're going to use it. So avoiding password reuse, again, really important in this one. If that you only give them the one password, they only have access to that account. How likely is this attack? Very, very likely. This would be my go-to starting point if I wanted to find out someone's password, especially if they're less technical. If it's someone who's more technical, I probably wouldn't bother because they're very unlikely to do it. But people who are less technical don't tend to understand why this is such a bad thing. Companies do tend to train people on this now, but I don't think anyone pays any attention. Credential stuffing. So this is shockingly common as well. And unfortunately, it's very difficult for you to defend against. There's not really much you can do. So what is it? So when a company has a data breach, whoever's, breach, whoever's managed to find that breach data bundles up all that data, they stick it into a file, and they sell it to people. There's money to be made in it, and it's very illegal. I don't recommend doing it, <laughs> but that is what happens. How do secure passwords in this help? So they don't, is the honest answer. Purely for the fact that you've either had your password leaked, which means they can see your password in plain English or whatever language it is it's written in, uh, or the alternative is the company that was storing your password had it encrypted, in which case you are somewhat protected, but they won't encrypt everything. So if we think about a bank, they would probably wouldn't encrypt things like bank account numbers um, or maybe even credit card numbers, that sort of thing. Those seem to be stored in plain text, unfortunately. So how do they help? Again, they don't. You hand it over. How likely is this attack? Very likely. Very likely. I know I've been a victim of credential stuffing. Um, there's been things I was registered on where it's cropped up all of a sudden that they've had a data breach and one of my passwords got leaked in plain text, thankfully. I don't use that anymore. Um, but honestly, anyone can be a victim of this. So in 2013, we have Yahoo, who have, they hold the record for the biggest data breach of all time. I'm not sure it's a record you particularly want to hold, but they have it. Um, the first American corporation, this was a bad one. So you might know companies like um, Equifax or clear score i'm not sure if you will come across them uh, but they're big in america and they do credit checks for people they're a, a credit agency and they had a lot of leaked records including people's social security numbers if i remember rightly in the u.s um, and a social security number is directly tied to your identity in the u.s it was never supposed to be but it is in this day and age and that exposed people to all kinds of identity theft it was a really bad attack i would argue although yahoo was bigger the first american corporate financial corporation even was much more severe now there's no real skill barrier to this one so it makes it more likely to attack the biggest issue is where do you find who's selling credentials and there's all sorts of underground and shady websites which people will sell them on. So taking a step back, we've covered a few attack vectors on why passwords aren't really going to save you all that much. Let's look at multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication is your entry point into the world of security in layers. So this is the alternative to relying solely on a password, which I think we've now demonstrated is not as secure as we might like, tends to consist of three different layers. I'm sure there's more, but these are the three that are often taught about. There's something you are. So this is biometrics. This could be a fingerprint. 
it could be um, an iris scanner, you know, where you scan an eyeball. Uh, it could be Face ID if you use the Apple products. It, it looks at you and says, yes, you're that person. Something you have. So you verify you own a device of some kind with a company you, you're going to register with. So this is usually in the form of a phone and you'll get a text message through before you log in. You probably have it with banks. Um, that's the something you have. You're demonstrating you have the phone. You can receive a code when they ask for it. Something you know, this is your password. Now, as you can see, something you know is just one component in this triangle of security. So it, mean, it means it's really important not to just rely on this one component. And that goes for all components individually because they can all be faked. So MFA helps because we break it up into three separate components. Even if the hacker manages to get through one layer, they've still got a few more layers to get through. It's very unlikely that a hacker is going to be able to get your password and then also get access to a phone or a fingerprint of yours and provide that at the time when they go to log in. So if, if you go to a website and you see, should I use MFA? Yes, you should. It's more important than anything else. That's it. That's everything. That's my talk on security. Um, if anyone has any questions about it, I'm happy to take them, although it may be better to do so at the end. Um, would anyone like to jump in at this point and take over? Yep. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, Adam, uh, while we try and work on Nikki's presentation, do you want to take through take us through the placements and other discussion points? And uh, we'll, we'll work on that simultaneously to try and see if Nikki's presentation is up and running, yeah? Adam? Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay, uh, uh, all, all the students, uh, if you have any questions, please keep putting them in Q&A box uh, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the presentations, yeah? Go ahead, Adam. No problem. So, um, as most of you are aware, um, depending on what courses you're studying, most of the courses offer the uh, professional placement option. Um, this professional placement is usually either between six months to 12 months, uh, depending on which course uh, is relevant to you. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to um, expand your experience um, within guidelines to the course that you're, you're currently studying as well. Um, now, most of you guys will be on the tier four visa and that will allow you to work full time whilst on placement. Um, so what we require of you at the university for your placement is you need to work full time, which is 35 hours or more. Um, you must be working Monday to Friday. Um, and most importantly, the, the job must be relevant to the course that you study. Um, and that's really important. So when you do get a placement, there'll be some paperwork um, that you'll have to fill in. Um, part of this paperwork, uh, we require your job offer letter and a form called the placement information form. Um, now I send that to your course leader and it's your course leader's responsibility to um, kind of sign off on your placement. So if, if the course leader doesn't think that the job uh, is relevant to the course that you're studying, um, then we won't be able, allowing you to go on that placement. So it's really important uh, that you make sure that the job that you're applying for is relevant to your course. Um, if you're unsure, we always recommend you ask your course leader before you apply for that role. Uh, most of them are, are fairly simple. So for example, if you're doing an MSc in computing, if it's a computing role, if it's anything to do with software developing or networking, um, it's usually relevant, so you won't have to worry. The, the only issue we get is if you come to me with a job for stacking shelves at a supermarket, obviously we probably start asking questions about that. So it is really important uh, that you make sure that job uh, is relevant to your course. In regards to helping you get a placement, it's really important uh, at this stage that we kind of highlight that the university does not provide you with a placement. We won't kind of give you a placement on a silver platter. It's your responsibility um, to go out and find your placement. However, we do help you with that search. So we obviously have workshops. Um, our placement team offer one-to-one -one guidance. So you can book a one-to-one -one appointment and we can go through your CV. 
we can go through interview techniques or any any questions that you may have. Um, we also advertise positions um, on an online platform called uh, um, the pre-placement portal, where you have access to look at all the placements that of companies that we've spoken to or we we currently deal with. Um, we have good relationships with companies all over the UK, a lot locally. Um, and obviously companies internationally as well. And that's something that's really important to highlight there as well is um, when you're looking for a placement, it doesn't have to be within the UK. You can uh, go on a placement internationally. Um, obviously, there's certain health and safety aspects and it's a very difficult time at the moment with the obvious COVID outbreak. Uh, but in usual circumstances, we would allow um, for you to go on an international placement. Um, I guess, um, obviously, do ask questions if you have any questions. Uh, my biggest tip, I would say, um, when international students do come over and looking for placements, the hardest thing that they find um, is getting the placement and kind of showcasing their skills that they already have. Um, so my biggest tip for you, is, um, the more experience that you can showcase on your CV, uh, the bigger the chance you're going to get your placement or the easier it is to get your placement. Um, so one of the first tips I say to international students when they come is go and get a part-time job, get some sort of experience on your CV. Your part-time job doesn't have to be relevant to the course you're studying. It's just something to showcase that you have the employability skills and you have the soft skills that come from uh, employment uh, to showcase on your CV. So the more experience you have on your CV, the easier it is to get a placement. And that's, that's really important um, to look into doing that as well. Um, and I guess finally for me, the other thing that's really important to know is you do have deadlines to get a placement. These deadlines I can't give you now because it'll always change depending on when your start date is and what course you are. Um, but there are deadlines in place and they will get told to you when you start your course. But it's really important that you make sure you get your placement by those deadlines. Um, because those deadlines are there to help you really. Because if you graduate and then get a placement, we won't be able to process that. So it's really important that we make sure all paperwork's done before you graduate your course, and that's what those deadlines are there for. Um, and like I said, those deadlines will be given to you uh, really early on in the process, so you, you're aware of them before you start. Um, but yeah, I guess that's me. Um, if you do have any questions, obviously type them in. I'm happy to answer. Um, obviously, it's very different depending on what course you're on. Um, but we can try and answer generically uh, as much as possible. Thanks, Adam. No worries. So what we're going to do is to try and run the computing and engineering presentation a little bit uh, so that uh, you all uh, who've been e waiting eagerly could get some uh, uh, glimpse of it, and then we'll take the question and answers. Feel free to keep typing your Q&A in the Q&A box, and then we'll answer them all at the end. Hi everybody, my name is Nikki Danino and I am academic lead for business development. I work at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK and I want to welcome you all to this webinar where I'm going to talk about the opportunities that we have at the university for you to study in computing and engineering and all the additional extracurricular activities that you can also do with us in order to make yourself the most valuable graduate in your field so that you can move on to to your chosen career. In addition, I'm going to talk a little bit about placements, so we might call them internships, because they are something that we value quite highly and we want to encourage all students to consider. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit about the university. So we call the University of Central Lancashire, sometimes we call ourselves UCLAN, that's our nickname, our, a shortened version of our name, and we've been around for a really long time. So the university was actually started in 1828 and we were called the Institution for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. And we are the fifth largest in the UK, so we've got lots to offer you. We've got over 120 nationalities on campus. We have a very diverse student body. And in 2010, we were the first modern university to actually be included in the QS World Rankings. Now we're based in the city of Preston, which is in Lancashire. If you're not quite sure where that is, if you have a quick look at this map of the UK, we're, we're in the middle of the UK and in the northwest of England. 
And the great thing about being in the middle of the UK is that we're very accessible. So we're only about 45 minutes from Manchester and Liverpool, and we're about two hours from London and two hours from Edinburgh. So it's a really great location if you want to use us as a base to explore the UK and see a little bit of the country. So if we move on to computing and engineering at UCLan, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is the fact that we produce graduates who can actually do the job and not just talk about it. And one of the ways we do that is by working really closely with the professional bodies in our field. So we work very closely with the Engineering Council. We also work very closely with the Institution of Engineering and Technology and with the BCS, which is the British Computer Society. And they accredit our degrees, they come to visit us, and they give us advice on ensuring that the courses that we teach meet the industry needs. This means that when you graduate and you apply for a job, you're ready to do the job and employers recognize this. We make sure that we give you real work experience. So a lot of the assessments are aimed at doing real work, you know, um, things that are up to date. And we also have placement opportunities, i.e. internships on all our courses. So that's a really great thing to add to your CV. Some of the things that you can do at our university are outside the scope of the courses. So for example, extracurricular activities that you can do in your spare time. Because we're such a large university, we have a lot to offer. You can join our leadership hub and go on a leadership program. You can do summer internships with us and get paid for them. There's also volunteering opportunities. But one of the things that we actually advise our computing and engineering students to do is to consider joining one of our subject specific clubs. So you can join the innovation club or the computing club. Of course, you can actually, you can also look at the wider option of clubs and societies at the university. So if you're interested in cricket, for example, you can join the cricket club. In terms of engineering courses at undergraduate level, we have quite a wide offering. These are all available on our website and you can find out more. And probably the most useful tip I can give you when you're searching for what course you would like to study or what subjects you'd like to study is to do your research and to look at the content of the course. Don't just go on the title of the course because the same course could have a different title in a different country. And sometimes you get really hung up on thinking, I need to find a course with this specific title. And actually the course is right there in front of you, but it's called something else. So do your research, use the internet, go on the university website, go onto the course pages and all the information you need is there. And if you're not sure, then please ask us. Ask somebody that you know that has got information about the university or ask a friend who's already been there. There are lots of things that you can do to help you in your research, but make sure you do it. Now, we've also got a wide offering on the MSc programme for engineering. And again, this is all available online. They've got placement options available on them. So one year course will become a two year course. Likewise, in computing, we've got a wide offering. BSc computer science is quite popular. BSc computing is also popular, especially because it's one of those courses where you can pick a lot of options. So you can actually design the course to tailor your interests. So if you know you like databases, you can pick more database options, or if you like networking, you can pick more networking options. It's, it's always a popular course because sometimes people arrive at university and they're not quite sure what they like to do. So you can come try a few things out and then and tailor your course accordingly to your interests. On the MSc um, UG, uh, PG programs in computing, the most popular course is IT security. This is probably because we all know that security is a high priority for every business and there are lots of jobs in security. So there's a really good career path in that. Something to note is that the PG courses do have both September and January starts. So for whatever reason, you're not ready just to come and study in September. You can always come in January instead. Now, I want to talk to you about placements. I mentioned before that we feel that placements is a really good thing to add value to your CV. Now, all the UG courses and all the PG courses we have do offer placements. On the UG program, we call them sandwich. On the PG program, we call them professional placement. 
And something to think about when it comes to placements is that it's great to learn your theory from books. And it's really important that you've got the background theory and the reading, etc. But when it comes down to it, you really have to apply that knowledge and nothing is going to be as useful to you as the experience that you can get from going on placement. All of our courses include the placement, as I mentioned, uh, will appear in your transcript. So you've got evidence that you've been on placement and that you've got the experience. And again, that's something that will really help you when you're looking for that graduate job. We've been running placements for decades. The university has been running placements longer than I've been alive. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you can try and work it out. So we've had really great feedback from students over the years. We know what we're doing. We know how to do them. And we've got lots of great contacts in industry because we've been sending students on placements for a long time. Now, we feel that a placement job has to be a real job. And that's really important. And as you can see from some of the comments of our students, they're not in an office making cups of tea and coffee and cleaning. Of course, if you're making yourself a cup of tea, by all means, offer the person next to you a cup of tea as well. But that's not what you're there for. You're there to do real work in your chosen field of study. Now, uh, this is a case study of a placement student. And the reason that I like to use this as a case study is because this student actually ended up getting a fantastic job based on his student project. So he worked on a student project called Fast Lane, and you can actually search for this online and look it up. The student in question is called Felix Krauss. And because he put his project online on GitHub, um, the company it was Twitter actually, they went to work for Twitter, found the project and got in touch with him and offered him a job. So Felix moved, uh, Felix was an international student and he moved from Preston to San Francisco to work for Twitter. Interestingly enough, uh, he was on the cover of Forbes magazine within a year of working for Twitter because he did some really great work on Vaseline. They even gave him a team to lead, and this was only less than 12 months after graduation, all because he had a really good project that we, we helped him with. After Felix left Twitter, he actually went to work for Google. So he then moved to New York. And this is a few years back now. Uh, Felix now runs his own startup company, so he left Google and he's got his own business. So it has to be for example, if you're doing a computing placement, you might be on an IT security course. You might find that the placement you get might not be exactly in IT security, but it is within the wider realm of computing. And that's okay because it's still a computing placement. If you're in a computing course, but you're washing cars, then it's not a computing placement. You can have a placement in a UK company. You can work anywhere in Europe or you can work anywhere in the world. Now, as a student, because you're still enrolled on the course, you don't need a work visa when you go on placement because it's part of your course and we can help with that as well. You have to remember that when you apply for any of our courses, you will also obviously get a visa to come and study in the UK. Now you've got to make sure that if you want to go on placement, that you apply for the course with placement included. So if you apply for a PG course, that's one year long, but decide that you want the opportunity to try and get a placement, then you need to apply for the course with placement and that turns the course into a two year course, which means when we write to you and we make you the CAS offer, you will get a CAS offer for two years instead of one year. If you don't want to do the placement, then just apply for the course without and we will give you a CAS offer for one year. The thing to consider though, is that if you do get a CAS offer for one year, and then halfway through your course, you decide you do want to do a placement. It's it's not impossible, but it becomes a lot more difficult to change your visa from a one-year visa to a two-year visa. So keep that in the back of your mind. So these are a little bit the logistics about the UG placements. Probably won't go into them into too much detail, but essentially it's a year. It's between the first two years of study and your final year. So it's in your third year of study. 
you are assessed on the placement by doing some reports. You do some monthly logbooks, you have to write two reports, and also we try and visit you if possible on placement. The PG placement is similar, except you have to finish all your studies and your project, and then you go on placement after that, and you only have to write one report and monthly logbooks. And we also try and go and visit you when you're on placement. Now, to finish up, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the work experiences that some of our past students have achieved. And you might recognize some of these companies and you might not. And that's because work experience can be achieved in a large company that everybody knows, or it could be in a small local company. And that's something that we've actually in, got for us in Preston. We are the only university in a city, which means that if we've got a local company that is looking for a placement student and you're studying with us and you're interested in that placement, you will not be competing with students from other universities because we are the only university in the city. That means there is, that there is more opportunity for you to get a placement in Preston. Of course, that doesn't mean that you have to do a placement in Preston. You can do a placement wherever you want. If you've got contacts in London or you've got contacts in Manchester and they can help you get a placement, then that's fantastic. You can use those as well. A lot of the bigger companies will not deal with us directly. So we will help you and guide you through the process of applying to them. So, for example, a company like IBM has got their own application process. Now, something to remember is that because these are real jobs, and they are paid jobs. We cannot guarantee that you will get a placement. What we can guarantee is that you have the opportunity on your course to do a placement without needing a work visa because it's part of the course. We can guarantee that we offer a CV help service. We offer a placement service where, where we can guide you towards where the placements are. We can give you mock interviews. We can also collate the opportunities and make them available to you all in one place. So we've got a, an online hub with that's passworded, so only our students can get into, and you'll see all the placements available there. So we can pretty much get you through the door into that interview. But once you see some of the big ones that you know, like Pirelli, Microsoft, Cisco, Accenture, students work at BA Systems, and they're based in Preston, so they have some really good opportunities. Now, you might recognize the Cadbury's logo and think, why is there a chocolate logo here? You know, why would a student go and place them into a chocolate um, company? Well, actually, that was a computing student. And you've got to remember that even Cadbury's has a head office and they've got big computer systems. So sometimes when you're applying for placement, you've got to think outside the box and not think, I'm just going to apply to engineering companies or I'm just going to apply to computing companies. There are lots and lots of opportunities. In the computing and engineering field really opens a lot of doors and it's a fantastic career to get into. There are more jobs than there are graduates, but obviously you need to make yourself stand out and having that work experience is what makes you do that. And I think that at UCLan we can help you get that work experience. We can provide practical teaching and assessments that help you be able to do the work. Um, we have teamwork because when you go and work in a company and you work in industry, you have to work with other people. Everything that we teach is backed up by research and also by industry because of our collaboration with our professional bodies. And also, we, we focus on teaching you skills that are transferable. So problem solving skills, skills that are to do with, with working with new technology and also skills about working with people. But the most important thing that we can do is give you that opportunity to gain industrial placement experience. So anyway, I hope this has been useful. And like I said before, make sure you go online, go on our website and do your research. That's the most important thing. Do your research so that you're confident that this is the right choice for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki, for that. Uh, so what we'll do now is uh, open the session for question and answers. We already have some questions. I'm going to start answering them first, and then we'll take the other question and answers. All the attendees, if you have any questions, keep typing in the Q&A. We'll run as many questions as possible. Um, while we answering it, the first question, Govind, you could probably answer this. Um, uh, 
can I know about master's program in architecture? Uh, Priscilla wants to know that. We have a master's course in architecture and uh, it's a two year course. We need a bachelor's in architecture. Uh, the most important thing in this uh, program to get admission is a portfolio. So you need to put all the creativity and then you need to share the link of that so that it could be sent to the tutor uh, to get it assessed by them. And uh, once we get a decision from the tutor, we can accept you onto the course. As far as you have uh, around 58% uh, in your bachelor's degree, you know, uh, the average of all your bachelor's degree of architecture, you'll qualify for the program. Uh, fantastic. Um, we've had another student asking for master's in digital marketing communication. Can you tell us something uh, about it? Program as such, but then we cover that uh, into our MBA course. MBA with professional placement, we cover in that. Okay, hopefully that should answer. Ajmal has a question. What are the common hindrances international students face for placement after graduating? Uh, Adam, you want to take that? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, basically, like I said earlier, um, it, it's mainly experience. Um, if you think of placements and, uh, and applications of placements in the recruitment process, it's kind of a ladder. Um, the more experience you have, the higher up the ladder you're going to be. So they're the, the, they're the kind of applicants that they're going to be looking at. Um, so they'll be looking at people with relevant experience first, and then any work experience after that, and then eventually they'll look at the ones that with, with no experience or relevant experience. So you want to make sure you're trying to push yourself up that ladder. Um, so that's, I think, where students fall down. I think they come to the university without any work experience and think that they can just sometimes get a job. Unfortunately, it's not that easy, and especially with current circumstances, it, it potentially could um, become harder. So the more experience you have in your CV, it doesn't have to be relevant experience to the job you're applying for. Any kind of work experience, whether that's part-time job you've had in the shop previously or working at a fast food restaurant, any kind of experience, I always say, make sure you put it on your CV. Um, the other thing I would say as a hindrance is, don't leave it too late. You want to be making sure you start applying for placements as soon as possible. Um, some companies even close their applications early. Um, so, for example, um, we have British Aerospace near us, based near us. Um, they had their applications only open for about a few months. Um, so you need to make sure you keep on top of the application, making sure you're getting them in early, um, and also making sure you have that experience. Uh, just to add, Kamal, you know, and uh, Adam, I would also like to add that it is very important for international students, you know, especially the uh, South Asian students, that a uh, few things uh, which are the must to do when you are in the campus, you know, before graduating also, because as we have been stressing on the placement courses into the masters, whether it's computing or engineering or even MBA, uh, most important thing is that uh, our students, you know, they must attend the lectures. This is very, very important, uh, attending the lectures completing assignments on time and uh, you know uh, clearing your exams giving your tests and then the most important thing is that you know visiting the 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 placement officer the career service department ask for help our team is there to assist you to to make you the the cv as per the uk market and uh, mock interview sessions so all these things are assisted you know the only difference is that you know if you go out of your shell and when you talk to people and when you ask for help, you are helped. Unlike India, where, uh, you know, this is for Adam and Sam also, the, the culture in India is that the placement officer is completely responsible for the placement of students. Whereas in the UK, the culture is completely different, whether it's our university or Oxford or Cambridge or any university. So it's just like, you know, it depends on the student, you know, how much initiative they are taking, how much help they are taking from people. There's no spoon feeding done. However, all the assistance is provided to students, those who ask for it. So if you are really keen to get your placement, as I said, that you know, attendance is very important, your uh, examinations are very important, and assignments are very important, you should do all these things on time. And then you also have to start your process of placement from second, third month onwards. You are not you know, required to finish your master's and then look for, or finish your nine months of thought course or 12 months, and then look for your uh, placement. You will not get it. 
So you have to start your process from second, third month onwards, you know, start working on your CV, start going for uh, your personality development classes, the do's and don'ts of interviews. So all these things are assisted by the university. So these are things in which you must look at it. And then after finishing your, your uh, nine months of thought course, if you are able to secure a placement anywhere in the UK, and once you finish your degree, most of, in most of the cases, our students, whether they are undergraduate or postgraduate, the same company asks them to come back and join them for a full-time uh, job. Which means now, uh, as we all know that students, those who go for two-year course, they got two years and four months visa. And beyond that, once the government uh, implements the rule uh, as graduate immigration route, under that students can stay back in the UK for two more years, which means you're going for a uh, one year of taught course, followed by one year of placement and possibility of two years of stay back in UK where you can work full time. So you need to look at the whole process and you should start your process from day one. Thanks, Govind. Um, Priscilla, who asked a question on architecture before, has a further question. How many projects do I need to include in my portfolio? Uh, Kamal, I just asked her to you know, share her email address so that you know, we can send yeah. her the uh, email so that yeah. she knows you know, what exactly we look at in the portfolio. Priscilla, please can you get in touch uh, with our office and then we'll uh, forward you the email address to uh, UCLan and then they'll advise you on the portfolio and how to build your portfolio. Okay, that should help. Okay, uh, I'll take the next question, uh, Govind. Uh, probably you can answer this. I want to... Uh, what, gentleman didn't give or lady didn't give the name, but I want to know if you feel like this is the best time to study abroad, whether the probability of finding a job will be more next year or two. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Kamal, because you know, as I said uh, before, that when you go for a two-year course, whether you're going for a one-year course or a two-year course or a bachelor's degree, this is the best time. A, because uh, now the government has announced that they are going to bring two years of stay back option for students, which is called graduate immigration route. Earlier, we were it was called uh, post-study work. So now students, those who are going for the master's in computing program or engineering courses in our university, they are paying for only year one. So despite of a two-year course, we are not charging anything in second year. So there is no uh, fee for the placement assistance that we, we offer. So which means students are paying only for the first year tuition fee. There is no second year fee. And then beyond that, they can stay in the UK for two more years. So which means you are paying hardly nine to 10 lakh rupees after reduction of the scholarship, you know, this is what uh, the amount comes. So after paying nine lakh rupees, you are going to stay in the UK for four years and four months. And you are studying for one year and you can work for three years, more than three years in fact. And after the Brexit, uh, I'm sure some of you would, would be knowing this, that after the Brexit, you know, uh, the European Union students, those who were earlier staying in the UK uh, without going for the visa, they could get their jobs easily because uh, there was no threshold of salaries. Whereas for international students, the minimum salary back it was around 30,000 pounds. Whereas the EU guys, they were staying in with a salary of 15, 16, 17 or 20,000 pounds. But now the government has said, people, those who want to stay back in the UK, they also have to compete with us. So which means we are at par with other international students or European students, and now we'll be competing with them. In fact, the government has uh, uh, reduced the salary packet from approximately 30,000 pounds to 25,000 pounds. So which means beyond your four years also, there is a strong possibility of staying back in UK, provided you have got a job of a salary of 25,000 pounds plus approximately, and a, a valid visa. So I think this is the best time to, to uh, go to UK. Uh, the living cost is, is not uh, very, very high. The tuition fee is not very high. It's one of the safest, safest destinations. It comes with placement. It comes with the stay back options. That sounds like an idea. I was also tempted to apply with uh, one year of payment and three years of stay back. Uh, I probably thought about it better before. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the question is actually a bit of a mix of computer science and literature. So Shweta is asking if I have a bachelor's degree in computer science, but study MA in English literature from the UK, is it possible for me to search for jobs that are more interdisciplinary, like UX writer or technical content writer? I'm not sure which one of you guys want to take this computing system. Sam, maybe. Sam? Hello, right. Yeah, um, so I would have thought that would be possible. Um, it would depend on whether it's a computing placement or an English literature placement would be the honest answer. Um, if it's an English literature placement, a UX writer or a technical content writer should be fine. If it's a computing placement, I would have thought, no, that probably wouldn't be fine. 
um, and you would have to go down a more technical route. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you so much for that uh, and sharing your experience uh, and your knowledge today. I think that's pretty much the end of today's session, unless anybody else has any questions while we're talking. Uh, the address for resident offices is at display uh, for Chennai and Hyderabad. And if you have any questions, feel free to call us, email us, and then we'll pass on your questions to a uh, team at UCLan and who will be in touch with you to answer more questions. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Adam. Thank uh, I, Kamal, uh, Kamal, we have uh, Nikki here. You know, uh, sh maybe you know she can just you know, speak for two minutes. Hi, Nikki. Uh, uh, do you want to discuss a few things while the students are still there? Uh, Nikki, can you hear us? Is she? Uh, she, I think she, uh, when she joined, she joined as an attendee. I have just uh, promoted her to uh, panelist. I okay, okay. Nikki, bear with us for a second. Uh, we're just changing your rights to speak and then we'll... It should be done already. Okay, Nikki, can you try now? You should have an option to... Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry I arrived late. Um, That's all right. Were there any questions about my presentation that anybody wants to ask? No, I, I think a, a lot of it was very detailed, but uh, I'll probably leave the session open for students to question since Nikki is here. We had a very detailed presentation on UCLan and the courses. So feel free to ask questions and then we'll be happy to answer. I guess while people are thinking of questions, I just wanted to add that, you know, doing further study or doing any kind of study is actually a really big decision and it's, it's even harder when you have to couple that with doing that in a different country. So I do want to reassure you that, that personally I think UCLan is a great place to study. I actually studied at UCLan four times. So I came to Preston as a student and ended up staying here. So do you know how they say that when you cut a tree in half, you can tell how old the tree is by looking at all the rings? <laughs> well, I think if you cut me in half, it's probably got Euclid written on it. <laughs> so, but one of the things to think about is the 360 degree approach in your studies. You've got to find a course that you're happy with, that you think will give you uh, good opportunities when you graduate but additionally you've got to think about your your life and the quality of life as well so think about where you're going to go are you going to be happy there will there be things that you can do outside of your course and I think that we offer all of that in Preston additionally I'm sure that Govind and, and the agents have spoken to you about um, living costs in the UK so we're a relatively cheap place to live which means your money will go further and the other thing that I, I did mention in the presentation that I think makes us a really good option is if you are thinking of getting a job while you're studying as a part-time job to earn some money, or maybe you're thinking of getting a job as a placement, that we are the only university in the city, which means that there are lots of opportunities for students from the university to work because you're not competing against students from other universities. And I think that makes a big difference if you're in a city with four or five universities. Has anyone come up with any questions? Yes, I think we have a question, Nikki. Um, Ajmo had a question. Let me fish it out. Yeah, I have a... Uh, mm, Can I put my video on? Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, somebody had a BBA degree. Yeah. He, uh, Ajmal has a further question compared to his previous one. I uh, completed BBA last year and I have one year work experience uh, in marketing. Should I get more experience or apply for an MBA now? I'm not sure which one of you would take that MBA question. Nikki? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I'm from computer science. Yeah, Jeff. so Golan, can you take that? Yeah. So I've already yes, answered. Work experience, yeah, Ajmal. I've, I've answered that, Ajmal, that, you know, yes, uh, he, this is the right time to apply. We uh, prefer to have one or two years of experience, but then uh, we are open for fresh graduates. He can definitely apply. And Ajmal, uh, uh, let me tell you, if you have scored 60% average in your bachelor's degree, you will qualify for 4,000 pounds scholarship. Our tuition fee for MBA is 13,700 pounds and it can come down to 9,700 pounds, which is the fee for first year. Second year, there is no fee because second year, there is an option of placement. 
and uh, if you are lucky and if you really work hard, if you get the placement, you can expect to earn anything between 12, 13,000 pounds, maybe 20,000 pounds. And then for the two years of stay back option under graduate immigration route when it gets implemented next year. Yeah, I mean, if I want, if I can add to that, one of the things that you have to think about is if you're in a classroom, <laughs> well, obviously we're not right now, and you have a look around and look at all your friends, they've all got a university degree nowadays. So what else can you do to make yourself stand out? So if you're going for a job interview, and both of you have a university degree, if somebody has an MBA on top of that, that's going to get you ahead of the game, isn't it? So you need to do things to make yourself stand out from other graduates. That's for you, Ajmal. Hope that answers your question. Uh, you're getting answers from the university experts who are not just university employees, but also uh, university alumni. So that could be your best example and best experience that they could share with. Yeah, I think Sam, Adam and I are all UCLan alumni. Yeah, that yeah. Was a so long it's... time ago though, over 20 years ago. <laughs> no, we, we won't let you reveal the secret. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a few generations of them today here. Yeah? Uh, anybody else has any other questions before we call the session to a close? I think if you have any questions, uh, the office addresses, contact information is on your screens. Take a note of it. And uh, as in staff, will be more than happy to uh, redirect your questions to UCLan team and to have them answered. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Nikki, for coming and rushing through your multiple sessions. Um, and thank you, Sam. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Govin, thank you very much. Thanks, well, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thanks, everybody. Thank bye -bye. you, bye. Thanks, bye. 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 Thanks everybody who's still online. We'll uh, call the session to a close. And if you have any questions, as in the team will be in touch with you later today and tomorrow, and then we'll redirect your questions uh, either or we'll find an answer for you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.